it's my absolute pleasure and delight uh, to wel- welcome Rapalang Rabana to speak with us today. Rapalang is an internationally re- renowned technology entrepreneur and education advocate. She's amassed 15 years' experience building innovative technologies. She's the founder of Rekindle Learning and Fast Forward Innovation, a thought leader, a young global leader of the World Economic Forum, and holds a business science degree from UCT with honors in CompSci and a master's all from University of Cape Town. So Rapalang, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak to us today. And it's a great pleasure to, uh, to have you. Thank you, Jeremy. Sounds like you guys are doing some great work. So happy to contribute where I can. Well, that's very kind of you. Well, we've got, uh, we've got 140 wonderful candidate fellows, we call them. Uh, all students who have a passion for education, uh, mm-hmm. who are deeply ingrained in innovation and, uh, and leadership. We've got a tradition uh, at JGF where every single guest that, uh, that we manage to speak to, we ask them the same question. We want to know who your favorite teacher was at school and why. Mm. Um, and uh, so do you mind <laughs> reflecting on that? Yeah, one? you know, and I thought so hard. I've had so many amazing, amazing teachers. I think I can count a handful of maybe two or three years where I think my teacher was average, but by and large, you know, I've had the huge fortune of being um, in private schools for, for all my education from Thornhill Primary School in Botswana to, to Rodin. Sure. So maybe my favorite teacher was actually the squash coach more than the academic teacher. And I think I loved her because her precision of clarity and explanation was just so enlightening. I, I had maybe not seen someone so passionate and had such in-depth knowledge of a topic, even though it, you know, it was, it was squash, but could not just relate the, the theory behind it, but understand how you manifest that in the body's movements. Um, So it was, yeah, it was, it was really great to, to be coached by, by, is it, yes, it was Mrs. Taylor. Yes, it was Mrs. Taylor. Um, I didn't end up being the best squash player, but I was pretty decent. (laughs) Wonderful. We've uh, uh, at JGF. We've had a, a, a wonderful and quite lengthy relationship with Rodin, and so lovely to hear that you were at school there. Um, yeah. And, uh, oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, actually, no, no. My favorite teacher was my piano teacher. Oh. Ah. <laughs> yeah. How could I forget Dr. Richter? Oh my word! So you can see, I have I've had so many wonderful teachers. <laughs> yeah. What was it yeah. about Dr. Richter that suddenly came to mind for you? Yeah, so I just realized um, in my mind when I thought that I hadn't seen that level of precision and clarity before, I'm like, actually, no, I had seen that in my piano teacher. So she was a PhD from from Russia, um, and she had, yeah, her incredible love and depth of understanding for music was was really, really powerful. And she, I think she got the best out of me. Um, really, really knew how to how to do that. Um, so it was, yeah. I've had so many amazing teachers in in all facets: sports, music, academics. It's I've been really well supported. Wow, wonderful to hear! It's such a clear message around uh, expertise. You, you know, you, yeah. you reflect on on somebody really understanding either the game of squash or understanding piano playing, but then mm-hmm. also, as you say, getting the best out of you, which uh, which is yeah. uh, such a critical part of uh, of expert teaching. Being a teacher, yeah, mm, quite true. So Rappel- quite true. Rappel- Rappel- Langer, as I as I kind of read more about the work that you've done, uh, uh, your journey is an exceptional one. Uh, at, at a very early age, you were recognised as an as an international entrepreneur, a global leader. Um, why don't you just share a little bit of, of that journey? Um, at JGF, we often talk about our journey to impact, and uh, most of the mm-hmm. candidate fellows are very early on in that journey. You know, some in yes. their first year, some in their fourth year doing their PGCE, but we're all on a journey, and we're all desperate to make impact. Um, mm. So why don't you share, what have been the highlights of your journey uh, towards impact yeah. as a technology entrepreneur and education activ- uh, advocate? Sure. It's, uh, I, I really have loved my journey. And I think for me, it, it probably started long before, you know, university and my first startup, 
where I think I had one of those minds with too many questions and just really pondering why in the world are we doing this thing called life and yeah, like where's it going? And I think from an early age, I felt exhausted by by the system and, and the hamster wheel and not knowing where it ends. And eventually I just, by the time I finished university, I was like, look, you know, I'm sure there's lots of smart people who say, you're supposed to get a job and you're supposed to do all these things and play more and more systems, but I actually don't care anymore. I <laughs> um, I think I've, I've been a great daughter to my parents. I have gotten through school. I've done most of what they asked me to do, but this is the end. And I I kind of let go of an idea or a need to sort of guarantee success and and in my mind, I think I felt that my parents have probably done the hardest part. They, they're the generation out of poverty. And in all fairness, they've given me, you know, so many advantages. All I have to do is work hard and, you know, don't pick up a drug or tick habit and I'll be fine in general. So I, I, I in my mind, you know, going on to go, you know, earn a big salary and be a hotshot executive. In my heart, I just didn't feel that was a way to spend my time or, or that it was a material achievement. Statistically, I was already guaranteed. So it's, it's, and I just thought that's just going to be a hamster wheel for, for, for no purpose really. And I, I wanted to finally get to a point where I could decide how I spent my time and what I gave my attention to, as opposed to doing what all these smart people, you know, had told us to do. And in, in a way I didn't particularly care that if it was going to take long I figure you know I'm 21 I've got at least 50 good years of productivity in me even if I don't know what I'm doing now I've got 50 years to figure it out and I think that's a good enough amount of time to get somewhere and and that's that's kind of how I started I I let go of of a need to do it at a certain way or at a certain pace and just decided to do things that actually make sense to me, that have value to me. So I'm not aggrieved about how I spent my time. Wonderful. You, you, you picked up so many themes in such a short uh, time. I'm, uh, I've got all sorts of <laughs> questions bubbling. The one is that you, you mentioned mm-hmm. your parents and uh, in your TED talk, you, you reflected a little bit on that. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, the, you know, the idea of a generation uh, transitioning from poverty, as you described, uh, mm. and, and the role that education played in that. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that story, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. My parents are really, really a cut, a cut above the rest. And I've, I've certainly won the, the lottery of the millennium um, <laughs> with them. And, you know, they came from um, a small village poor only piece of clothing was you know the the clothes they wore to the one outfit they had for school they would walk barefoot in the winter to school and you have all of these uh, stories of of strain and um they somehow miraculously managed to get through high school my mother even more miraculously so she was the only daughter or girl for most of her high school in her classes um and at this point they were studying in in Botswana and they both managed to land scholarships to to study. Um, and my dad went to University of Lagos, and my mom went to Nairobi um, on on these scholarships. And it was in particular for my dad because he was he always talks about how poor his scholarship was. You know, he spent about seven years in Nigeria, most of the time having malnutrition because he couldn't eat the food or hold the food and and malaria. So and so whenever I thought that computer science was hard, (laughs) my parents would always be like, so just put in more hours. We don't understand. You've got food, you've got shelter, you've Mm. got time. So what's the problem? Just just put in the hours and they would. And for me, yes, I, I can imagine having to go through seven years and undergrad and a master's feeling sick. And malnourished for most of the time is is a heck of a feat. So they certainly set a, a high standard for us. And I think for them, you know, my dad's father was was really clear that the education was more important than him looking after his his collection of cows. 
and that yeah I, my dad's favorite line was that um you know your your family or someone around you is going to steal these cows from you anyway one day <laughs> So rather go and get an education <laughs> that no one can steal from you. And and for my mom, she kind of self-motivated her way through everything. She she was supposed to get married off and she declined that demand from her mother quite early on and was just determined. I think for her, it was a sheer determination to not be that poor for the rest of her life. And she was just not having it. So I what where they got those ambitions and and yeah it's it's it's, it's remarkable cuz um there was nothing in their life context that told them they they have a right for better yet yeah. they pursued it um with a single mindedness that yeah is still mind blowing um and similarly they ensured that their children got the finest education they could possibly afford with with much struggle um you know private school fees are absolutely insane but it was it was the thing that had to had to happen and and you know they only bought their first luxury cars in in their sixties mm-hmm. as everything was was going into the children's education for myself and my two brothers what a what a testimony to the role of education and uh, that kind yeah. of no nonsense approach you know you have the basics now get on with it you, you you haven't spoken too much about your startup uh, with uh, rekindle uh, uh, rekindle uh, learning, uh, mm-hmm. but I'm dying to know how, what what was the catalyst that started that? What was it like? Yeah. Uh, you know that kind of that that initial startup phase for you. How, how did that come about? And and tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So I think I you know I'm coming out of my first startup, Diego. That was telecoms and voice over IP software. You know, it was really cool. We had an incredible journey, and I learned from that seven year experience that you know there's no easy company to build. <laughs> there's no easy way way out. And um, while the business was you know deeply intellectually stimulating. We had kind of followed it out of, um, you know, curiosity and to address our own needs as students who couldn't afford to to make calls on on your prepaid credit, et cetera. And then I realized, you know, a business, come, it takes everything out of you. And then when you think you've given it all, it comes for another three big scoops. <laughs> and I thought, you know, if if you're going to go through that kind of pain and strain, it's just got to be for something that I'm actually quite happy to take the pain for because when you don't have the cash flow when you don't have enough staff, when you don't know when the next sale is coming, it's like you don't want to be at that place where it's, 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 it's purposeless and the intellectual stimulation is not enough. So I think the education piece had always been in my mind, perhaps because of how strong you'd paid a role in my parents, but also from the time I was at school and, and even at, at Rodin, um, with, with all the support and privilege, I did start thinking to myself then that I remember very clearly thinking to myself that um, I would learn so much faster and get better so much quicker if somehow I could keep track of the things I was getting wrong. Yeah. And we couldn't, I promised myself I'd spend more time revising the stuff that you got wrong and you know that never happens. There's, there's better things to do at that age. And then, you know, you just get better at the stuff you were already good at and the things you were not, you know, would slip by. And then that thought sort of stayed with me. And then when I thought, let me actually try figure out if one can build a sustainable business in the learning and, and training and education space, this was the aspect of learning that I really wanted to focus on and figuring out how could we create that learning um, pedagogy that allows you to track where the student is, is struggling is essentially and customize what they do next based on what they need to reinforce and, and address misconceptions about. And that's the basis, the core basis of the, of the learning algorithms in our platform today. Mm-hmm. And over time, you know, we've also, social media has become big. So the whole bite-sized learning was even more relevant then. And it's, it's been amazing to, to, you know, to have clients and, and people that were battling to get through professional exams pass 
when they had the textbook of 500 pages, but just never got through yeah. it and, and never managed to pass, being able to do that with the application. So for me, that's uh, it's an incredibly rewarding experience for mm. something you had put in, imagine in your head to manifest in reality and be paid for it. Oh my God. <laughs> I love that. You've, uh, uh, you've mentioned some of the themes um, that kind of fit into this box that we loosely call digital pedagogy, the idea of bite-side learning, of adaptive learning. Um, mm. You mentioned in your TED talk, uh, closing the, uh, the feedback loop, and you've mentioned yeah. it now, getting that quick feedback about what I do know, what I don't know. So I'm going to park those because those are really interesting themes for us. And, and I want to come, come back and kind of pick your brain a little bit more around some of those in terms of your experience. But many of the candidate fellows that are, are, are listening to us um, will see you as a role model. They'll look at you and go, wow, I can see myself, you know, in you. Uh, part of your journey, I think, may speak to, to them. Uh, the kind of impact that you're having for many of them will be the kind mm-hmm. of impact uh, that they will want to have in education. So I'm going to pick a little bit on this kind of theme of, of m- mentoring and role modeling. If mm. you were able to kind of look into the eyes of a, of a second, third, fourth year student, uh, what are the kinds of messages you would want to say to a young person at the moment based on your experience uh, in yeah. this particular sector? Sure, I guess it's, it's probably similar to what I would say to to people in 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 any given sector who are you know trying to figure out their their path and journey is that the most important thing is to act um, act on your convictions of of the world or or how the world should be, and this leads you a path down the path of sort of authentic innovation, and by that I mean innovation that addresses things that you have had a lived experience of that you have observed perhaps for many years and you there wasn't an answer then but there were sort of tiny hunches along the way of of what if or why and you know there's a lot of research now that real creativity and and innovative ideas are built over years even decades and it is the stuff that you cared about as a child, cared about as a teenager, that you actually have a depth of perspective on that would allow you to use that to leverage, to, to create something of, of competitive value. Mm-hmm. And I would rather you go down that path than try to read, you know, all of the Harvard Business Review, what, what's, and, and kind of pick out what sounds smart there. Because at the end of it, to keep going, that perseverance comes from doing something that has been an itch for a long time, that aligns with what you're seeking in the world, that allows you to go further down a path that you think or you feel is is your life path. And delivering anything of value is just going to take five, ten, it's going to take a chunk of your life. So it needs to be aligned with who you are. And that because perseverance is such a big factor of whether anything will happen more than intelligence and more than preparation, it's, it's just so much easier when you do stuff that is aligned to who you are. And, you know, my second piece of advice would be that don't think of professional jobs as those are, you know, artificial labels that you know, education system and society invented along the way to organize stuff. But so don't don't use adopt a label like I'm a teacher because then that forces you to have a vision of sitting in front of a classroom per se. It's um it's more around, you know, what are what are what are the what are the things that or concepts you toy with. Maybe it is about education, but it might be around how frustrating it was to um, not have five rands to pay for civvies day or something like that. And I think that's what uh, Doug um, Curry sort of, you know, built, built a business on. And it's, it's those, it's those sort of hunches or the things that you as a person noticed that are going to be the most impactful things for you to work on. 
Mm. Wow, you've, you've spoken right into the heart of so much of what we do. I, I, uh, Yesi's listening to this. I hope your ears are pricking up at the moment. Uh, Rapelang, uh, <laughs> we, we have something called the Yesi Project, which uh, okay. is a, it's an outflow of, of the kind of entrepreneurial mindset pillar of our program, which is this mindset that says, you know, what are the problems that I'm experiencing in my day-to-day life? Uh, mm. Are other people experiencing it? And then going through a, a design thinking process to try to iterate on possible solutions and test those. Uh, and part of the ESC project uh, is to identify a particular prob- problem uh, that they've experienced and want to try to uh, innovate around and then put in a solution. And so part of our summit yeah. is is our ESCs presenting back on their first experience there. So oh, cool. I love that tag, authentic innovation. It, it speaks to deeply understanding the lived problem that you're trying to address um, and mm. yet bringing a whole new set of skills uh, to innovate around solutions. Um, and then thank you for picking up that idea of perseverance and grit. Uh, ESCs, yeah. you're probably listening to this and check, <laughs> nodding your head going, yep, I had my first go and it was blooming hard. <laughs> yep. Possibly yep. what I yep. tried didn't work. <laughs> and it's, uh, I, I hate, you know, I, Jeremy, I actually hate to um, mentor first-time entrepreneurs because <laughs> I can feel the angst of the future pain and I, yes. I just can't be around to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I can do sort of year three and four, yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just no. too hard for me to do the beginning. I, I hear you. I think those involved in this kind of entrepreneurial education, but one of the biggest hurdles is, is, to, is to get students to try and fail. And, and you, yeah. all, you have to try and fail a number of times, uh, you know, to kind of get, as you say, that, uh, that experience to, to mm-hmm, be able to mm-hmm. persevere through. Yeah, yeah. Do you mind if we shift back to um, uh, the, the kind of heartbeat of Rekindle Learning was around using mobile technologies, particularly to close the feedback loop and thereby promote learning. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, it seems like you've had incredible success in the corporate space. This may be an unfair question, so feel <laughs> free to dance around the edges of it. But our, um, our particular passion is around, at the moment, uh, school learning, in particular for, for, for us, uh, high school learning. Sure. How do you see this idea of mobile technologies being used to, to close the feedback loop? How could that be uh, 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 used, utilized, uh, leveraged in the high school environment based on what you've seen in corporate? Uh, and I know that's a really hard question. There are no easy answers. To no, these no, 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 no. I've what, thought about uh, it a great, great deal. <laughs> yeah. What, 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 what's yeah. your view on that? Sure. It's, it's, it's the, the initial hope was to have focused on schooling and, and, and the like in education. It's just so incredibly hard to build a business um, there, especially you're self-funded and bootstrapping. You've got to then end up going to the customer that can continue to pay for your developers as you're trying to figure stuff out. But my hope has always been that if you can validate something and make it work, in the market that sort of can pay over time, the cost of that service provision goes down and your efficacy and how well it works improves. And then it's easier to access harder markets, but that is a a long journey. Um, That said, you know, for me, education is something I expect to care about for, for the remainder of my life. So what I have actually had conversations about with a couple of schools and even the Department of Basic Education (laughs) was really around how the fact that when we look at the when we look at results like the last time I did this analysis in grade eight mathematics etc when someone is failing those exams they are not failing at problem solving which constitutes a count remember now 10 percent of what that exam was and um, complex application maybe another sort of 30 percent but they're failing on recall and basic application of the principles and theory. So my view was that this kind of rapid reinforcement, um, bite-sized learning, um, adaptive personalized learning that tracks where you are, the concepts you're not understanding and brings you back and gives you that corrective feedback and explanation. The if we if we empowered students with that, you can get them through that bottom layer of recall 
and basic application. I, I never believed that you can solve all aspects of, of education on technology or mobile phones, but that is the part that computers can nail. And then the teacher can progress to the point where they do the complex application and problem solving. But you're not going to get there without mastery of the core principles of, of any topic. So my view has always been that, yes, you can continue school classes and things, but you want a session after those classes where, you know, maybe 90 minutes or something you're doing these uh, learning exercises on an adaptive learning platform and you are getting the reinforcement of ideally what was covered in class that week. And then you would get to a point where improvement is much quicker. So in, in the traditional school environment, especially in lower resource schools, you'll write a test every now and again, and you'll get your script back if you do get it weeks later. Many don't get a script back, so there's no opportunity for, for, for closing the feedback loop. And without closing the feedback loop, it, it was an entirely pointless exercise. So, and there's a couple of big research studies that were done in the U.S. on this, where they looked at what education interventions are actually effective, whether it's better qualified teachers, charter schools, um, an extra year of preschool, an extra year of high school, all of these things. And they came out with the conclusion that rapid reinforcement was literally by far and away the most effective way to improve learning outcomes. So I see a big role for this in, in schooling. Um, and I usually get criticism, but you can't do problem solving. I'm like, that's not where your students are failing. Maybe in matric, <laughs> that's where they're failing. But you could have gotten a 60% having done this. And then you open the world for them because then they feel competent to move up. One of the the, uh, the people that we, we follow at JGF uh, quite closely around student achievement is John Hattie, who did a uh, continues to do a powerful meta analysis on the uh, the factors that impact uh, on student achievement. And mm. uh, w- one of those in his top five, I, I think it has an effect size of about uh, 0.73, is around teacher feedback to uh, to ah. students. Um, and that's exactly what you're saying is, is digital technologies are good at certain things and, and, and a quick feedback as to whether you've got something right or wrong uh, and then adapting is, is really what they're good at. And that's something that we can, can digitize. Uh, you know, I love that. Yeah. yeah. I'm always curious. Uh, I, I, I love technology. I used it in my own classroom a lot and I was always really interested and continue to be what, do, mm. what does technology do really well? And what do, you know, flesh and blood human teachers do really well? And where, where yeah. is that kind of balance? And, um, and, and for me, it's not an either or, it's a both and, oh. and working out, you know, how those different things uh, play together. If you look at something like Bloom's taxonomy that looks at the different kind of levels of learning, you, you know, the, the, the lower levels are around mm. recall and basic understanding. And I, I think you've... Uh, You've spoken quite uh, uh, insightly, uh, in, insightfully uh, on, on how technology can play a key role there. As we move higher up and we start to look at issues of, you know, uh, comparisons, review, opinion forming, mm. creation, what's your view on the role of technology in, in that space? Is it, is it sure. the kind of thing where you're saying, no, humans need to step into that space now and, and just be that? Or... Do you think that there's a key role that technology can play in the higher order uh, uh, elements of learning? So I have spent quite a bit of time thinking around what is the role of technology? What is the role of, you know, the human um, teacher, et cetera. And it is definitely a blend. And sort of I have got two areas of thinking around it. One, you know, as you mentioned in the Bloom's taxonomy, technology, you know, based learning can get you to maybe level four, Um, of evaluating analysis if you have done the content exceptionally well and that takes is an art form in and of itself most people when they use technology to create content only do the first one or two maybe three levels of Bloom's taxonomy but when you actually want to do the higher levels you your ability to craft questions and content um, you know has to be 
quite, quite brilliant. And I've worked with a number of content creators and subject matter experts, and I can really tell you that it's hard for most people. There, there's definitely, I think, limited scope for using our technology for the create element in the in the in this in the kind of work that you're doing at, at schools typically. Um, but that said, everything that we've just described now, in my view, is <clears throat> is still part of the world of content-driven learning. There's still a, in my mind, there's still a whole big shift that needs to happen to the how of learning as opposed to the what of learning, which is going to become much more crucial as, as you know, the half-life of content declines faster and faster, where we're now needing to shift from a space of curating content, you know, according to Bloom's taxonomy, to curating experiences that build behaviors and mindsets. And that is a whole other art form that our education system hasn't even really become to gr- come to grips with. Your exceptional teachers know how to do it intuitively. So like even the squash teacher I mentioned, she could figure out where on your, you know, the levels of expertise you're at and match you with a player that will help you go to your next level. And that is an art form. Most people are not able to do that, where you're, you're able to see where someone's experience level is and position a sort of just right challenge that gets them to that next tipping point. And being able to understand and observe and curate the challenge that will help the learner you know, progress to that next level is, is hard, hard work. And I think in my mind, quite separate from the world of, of the Bloom's taxonomies, et cetera. Right now, we have relied on great coaches, you know, Olympic athletes will have those people, but most of us will, will, won't have access to that kind of expert experience curators. So one of my hopes and dreams is that we actually leverage AI and virtual reality more in the future to bridge some of those gaps. And by this, I mean that if you're learning, you know, training to become a doctor or a nurse or, you know, a network technician, et cetera, we have seen how VR has been used, you know, in aviation or simulations rather at the time were used to, you know, develop people's technical competencies in things and, you know, to get them to an incredibly high level of proficiency before they're actually in the real world. So we've seen that happen a lot for technical skills, but I believe there's actually now room to see it for higher order skills. Um, and there's some very cool work happening with some some of these companies, mostly overseas, because they've got the funding to to do it, where they're curating virtual reality experiences that actually prepare you to do a negotiation. So before you go and negotiate a major supplier contract, you've been in a VR, you've interacted with this AI driven avatar. Um, Depending on how you're responding, et cetera, it will increase the complexity of the negotiation or um, decrease it if you're battling, you know, to get past the the first thing. And in fact, if we get to a point where we understand the different levels of expertise in, in everything, it'll be quite possible to build that in to AI driven experiences in virtual reality to pitch experiences at the level of the learner um, and their readiness. And I imagine in a context like South Africa, where where I really believe that the youth are experience starved um, and the neurology and neuroscience tells us that experiences and and can do moments where you overcome challenges is, is fundamentally how your neurology and grows. And without that, you know, any content driven learning doesn't grow a neural pathway. So given that, you know, they're growing up in an experience starved environment from, you know, never traveling across the border to maybe not learning how to ride a bicycle or to never getting to complex mathematics, et cetera, this, this really affects long-term potential when you think about the, the paucity of neural pathways that are developed as a lack of that. So I would like to imagine, you know, that we could fake the lack of experiences by dematerializing the experience. So it's not dependent on you having highly educated parents with a rich set of experiences themselves 
who, um, you know, you didn't get a chance to sit around a dinner table every day and, and develop your perspective of the world. And imagine a young person was able to sit in that experience to prepare for a job interview, to t- test and build that communication skills, that team meeting skills, all of these things that are incredibly difficult to access for the vast majority of young people and why even if they get a job, they don't progress in large companies. I mean, this this is actually, this is the real problem of education for our generation. I, you've just blown my mind. You've, you've taken a whole lot of like key concepts that we at JGF have spoken about and just brought them all together in such a profoundly succinct way. I, I think you've answered like all of my next five questions <laughs> all in one go. I, 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 uh, amazing uh, thank you for for the succinct way in which you're able to express that um you, you and, mentioned- and i didn't say anything incorrectly did i because this is all <laughs> I, I i've never really validated it with with education experts <laughs> well, no you, you 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 picked up initially in in your last answer this idea of learning from people around you and those close to you and and mm. i um, uh, Vygotsky, Vygotsky speaks about the zone of proximal development of needing to be close to people who are just a little bit further advanced. And I love that idea. It's something that I've seen work profoundly well in a classroom setting where a slightly more advanced student is able to, you know, really speak the language of a learner. Um, yeah. And then you picked up this idea of, of a curriculum, uh, a content driven curriculum and how we really need to move beyond that. And the idea of curating uh, learning experiences and understanding the learning process. And, uh, and I hope candidate fellows, again, your ears pricked up because uh, Rapelang, we, we run a, a program called learning to learn. It's based on uh, mm. uh, um, the learning power approach uh, that, uh, that okay. some, somebody local a subject matter expert has developed into this course, really getting down to the basics of what does it mean to learn? How do I learn? What are the key We call them learning muscles that we need to develop to become powerful learners um, that are able to learn in different ways uh, and in different situations when when it's needed. Um, And then linking that to AI and VR in terms of experiences is is just Mm -hmm. profound. We uh, we've taken a dipped our fingers into the VR world every now and again and uh, uh, and just love what what the opportunities are there. Mm. I'm going to push you a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> if you were given an uh, an unlimited budget by the DBE, you said you've been chatting to the DBE. Mm. If you could make, to take your learning around what you've just spoken, and you could make a change to what we do in high schools currently in South Africa, mm. and, and, and don't worry about constraints. Don't, don't worry yes. if it costs too much. <laughs> let's put constraints aside. What would you right. do? What would be the thing that you would want to do? So what I would do is... Oh, so many things. It gets me so excited. Okay. <laughs> One is, um, you know, we're, we're in the world of transition, in my mind, still from a heavily content-driven learning and education approach to a, an experience-driven one. And you can't entirely drop the content one, not only because of our education system, but international education systems. But I think that just has to be a smaller component of what we do every day. And to condense the amount of effort and resources that goes into that, you have to be leveraging um, digital technologies in the right way. So I'm not necessarily saying drop schools or drop teachers. I'm saying that teachers do have a certain expertise. Let's add that personalized learning in in your tutorial or homework sessions. And the new skill that teachers would have to learn is how to read those kind of reports so that they can adjust their teaching and whatever else. I think that and a bit more would would dramatically reduce the effort it takes to make progress in a content-driven educational system. Then I would look at all these higher order skills that we all, you know, keep hearing about creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, communications, etc. And I would get us past the, the big labels of these words to really understand what does a level one creative person do and what does a level 10 creative person do? And what is the series of steps that gets you there? And what are the series of, you know, what's the scaffolding that gets you to number 10? 
and let's 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 actually understand that a vast majority of educators don't know either actually and i've even asked some people at, at wits and lecturers and what have you this is all a black hole um, and I don't think it's hard. I think that you just need to create the right environment for people in the room to actually say this is the objective and and get it and get it done. <clears throat> and the purpose of that would be one to empower the teachers that are ready to be able to understand how they build those skills, as opposed to here's a creative exercise, here's a critical thinking exercise, and we kind of hope to God that that exercise will sort everything out. And it, it really, really doesn't. There's, there's more science to this than, than we know. Um, and when that understanding is clearer, then you can build the, the AI-driven VR experiences for this and dematerialize experiences beyond having to have an expert facilitator in the room, which is unrealistic for for most schools to ever be able to achieve in 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 my generation i think so we need to dematerialize these high quality learning experiences so that every school you know yes you've got a computer lab but you've also got a space with just vr headsets and as part of your learning you are immersed in these range of experiences of increasing complexity by the time you you finish school, so that even if you haven't had the opportunity to to be at a routine, to be raised by parents that are hotshot executives, et cetera, you have seen a taste of the world beyond this. And you're not, I feel like so many young kids get to a big corporate and they spend the first three years just being overwhelmed Mm -hmm. with a different world. And you want to get past that because once you fall back in those three years, you kind of never recover. You stay a data capturer forever. And it's it's just tragic that we, yeah. we leave people's brains to die so early. So I would significantly dematerialize yeah. um, the, con- the hardest parts of education that technology mm-hmm. can do better. Yeah. We're going to draw to a close. You've, you've been incredibly generous with your time. There, there, there are two questions I want to ask before. before <laughs> okay. Uh, the one is just to come back to this concept of digital pedagogy. I think that uh, um, that that there's general agreement amongst educators broadly that we have a relatively good understanding of how how we learn in a kind of face to face traditional bricks and mortar type environment. There, there, there are a number of different theories, and each theory focuses on a different element. But by and large, most new teachers come into the learning environment with at least some level of theoretical understanding. During uh, the lockdown and uh, and the shift online, you you know, suddenly you had teachers all over the all over the world. I was about to say all over the country, all over the world, who are now kind of trying quickly to become online teachers. And uh, of course, some things translate easily, but by and large, there's not a there's not a deep understanding of how we learn digitally and that's yeah. a kind of growing area of theoretical development so yeah. i'm not asking for the closed theory yet unless you have one in your back pocket but in your yeah. experience and the work that you've done what are the key themes that you've seen around how people learn on online uh, in an online environment in a digital environment what, what are the key mm-hmm. themes that have kind of come out for you that you could kind of plop into this bucket that we call digital pedagogy sure sure i have thought a few times around you know which parts of the learning value chain as mm-hmm. such do you sort of plug technology in and i think the things that are 100% clear where there is some good body of research is one the administration of schools and supporting teachers with administration and marking payments, management of schools, checkbox. And then in terms of the learning world, the the rapid reinforcement checkbox. Flipped Classroom also has some good sort of body of knowledge that, you know, watching a video and being able to rewind and pause and rewind and pause um, is, is actually very helpful versus only having an opportunity to sort of hear once um, and the like. What I think hasn't been proven at all is that, you know, digital textbooks are easier to consume than print textbooks. That's, I actually still haven't found evidence of that. And 
I think that digital textbooks become incredibly valuable when you can do augmented reality stuff on it. So if it is a heart on a page and you can, through your phone, it now becomes 3D, then I think digital textbooks are a cut above the rest. But in general, the PDFs and actually much harder to consume than, than print than print books. Then I think the area um, where, you know, you mentioned how teachers were sort of battling to do this transition. And a lot of it, I think, is because they were trying to do it the same way they were doing it in, 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 in the classroom, where I think if I was in their shoes, I might have recorded the class I was going to give before, um, because talking to someone in real time on a computer isn't great, isn't helpful <laughs> in a way. It's you it might be better off, you know, putting it at times two speed because they know this, or rewinding and rewinding to to get back. Um, I don't know that they significantly more value to do it real time. And then you know, go into the class in terms of this is what we discussed. Someone tell me what you understood by this. What are your questions, et cetera. So a mini flipped classroom, but the teacher sort of doing what they would have delivered before. Um, and then that teacher, you know, if the students are going through personalized reinforcement exercises, looking at that data every week or every, every day to actually see if that session was effective. Right now, teachers have very little feedback other than, you know, who spoke in class mm -hmm. in terms of feedback as to the efficacy of that, of that session. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not in the camp where you want to can schools or you want to dramatically change how teachers teach. I think that those change management requirements are enormous and I think un, un, unrealistic in many cases. But I think what we can do is get teachers to a point where they are data analysts themselves, mm -hmm. which is, which is, yeah, I think going to be absolutely essential for them to benefit from. Yeah. Uh, again, so many wonderful themes. Just this last one on data analysts. Um, uh, this term expert teacher that we use sometimes, uh, uh, John Hattie describes some key characteristics of what, what he classifies as an as a, uh, expert teacher. And one of those is the ability to constantly collect data, analyze it in terms of the learning process and be able to have very quick feedback in terms of how you adjust yeah. it. So, so I love that. Uh, some of our students uh, listening are, are are in a pilot study around online textbooks at the moment. So we'll listen oh, with interest it? around. Oh, I'd love to um, see that result. Please do yeah. share that report when done. So, <laughs> you, you know, I, I think it with horror of reading online, but but for some of our students, they're like, yeah, that, that's just how I work and, I, you know, different strategies. So, so that's a really interesting one to see. Mm, uh, mm, and mm. the flip classroom has always been uh, one of my favorite techniques. Actually, I started uh, using that when I was a science teacher. Um, and I had such, a, such this last week, uh, this last weekend, yeah. I was I was in an environment where a young student was learning something in a, in a traditional classroom environment. And they were watching videos in this classroom and he came out going, oh, I wish I could just put it to times 1.5 speed. And it's so interesting that we become used to the idea that we can control the speed of people talking to us. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> um, and how like, that, yeah, that's just become And it's really normal. helpful. If it's a slow topic or sure. something I understand, yes. I need to watch, listen to it at times too. Otherwise, I'll disengage. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I hear you. <laughs> Yeah. All right, I, I, I want to bring this, I, I could carry on all day. And, and uh, mm -hmm. so we've gone over our time already. Thank you for, for the generosity of your sharing. I want to finish by bringing back the, uh, the concept of your role modeling and mentoring. And in particular, you know, we've got 140 students listening uh, uh, to this interview. Um, if you could imagine speaking to yourself, when you were back yeah. at university, <laughs> what, what, what would be the couple of things you'd want to say to yourself? And, you know, obviously in, in essence, say to, to the students, what, what do you think from your vantage point, mm -hmm. what are the key messages that you'd want to just drop in uh, into their ears at the moment? Sure. What would I say to little me? Um, <laughs> I would say to her one was um, it's, 
the the this is one in this is one in the journey and and not the and not the and not the race and not the sprint like you 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 are smart you are well prepared but by golly this is this is also a test of of time and resilience yeah. and mm-hmm. let's 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 cut down the hurry and you mm-hmm. know invest in in the richness of your life experiences the richness of the relationships that are going to help you figure out stuff um and your your strategy thus far little rapelang of 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 brute force hard work and time at every single challenge that you've ever encountered mm-hmm. is no longer sustainable <laughs> now the problems are getting too big and too complex to solve in that manner so and i didn't have this level of awareness then but now thanks to a lot of coaching i i do understand that that's actually that brute force thing example or joke that i made is was actually just a strategy i had developed as a child to be able to deal with life and to cope and i didn't know that you know when you navigate yourself to adulthood you choose these strategies subconsciously and you have a choice as you go into adulthood to adopt different strategies that you can use in different situations and not be so hung up on this is who I am because you your personality you know as, they, as some people have said is is largely a response to trauma and you can now as an adult choose the behaviors you want to want to adopt and the sooner you get into that journey you know the much easier life is going to be um and then having a richer tool set of stuff um and yeah i wish i had known that then actually i think I, I wasted a lot of time trying to make sure that what i was doing before was was still working and was still right when i'm now an adult and i actually have choices i don't need to subconsciously act i'm going to resist the uh, uh <laughs> the desire to just unpack everything you've just said because you speak so wisely into into the current reality of of so many of us uh, within the JGF community um but thank you uh once again for your time uh you've been incredibly generous with uh, your experience and with your wisdom uh we're going to reflect on many of the things you've just said uh, for for a good deal of time because you've picked up so many themes that are central to the work that we do and mm-hmm. to the kind of future anticipation of areas of impact. So thank you yeah. for bringing your own perspective on it, your own lived experience, your journey towards impact. It's been uh, an incredible conversation. I've been deeply privileged to have it. So thank you. Thank you Thank for your time. You. And mm. I'm going to slip in there. We we really hope to engage with you further. Um, <laughs> there, there's so many exciting things that you're involved in that uh, that overlap with uh, the JGF community. So hopefully we will uh, we will be able to continue this relationship. So thank you so much for oh, your time. It's a real pleasure, Jeremy. And yeah, keep up keep up the good work. There's there's lots to be done. <laughs> mm-hmm.